Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, to another chapter of A Court of Mist and Fury, written by Sarah J. Moss, read by yours truly, Free Water, with the exclamation point or the added emphasis. Um, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about it. I was like, Lady Wada had asked me how far I was getting through the book. I was like, you know, we're over halfway. Looking at the chapters, there's still a ton of chapters left. But about this point in the first book, we were basic. I felt like we were basically done, right? No, we're just we're just getting into the meat of it now. Uh, we managed to narrowly avoid death for our heroes. Maybe heroes? I don't know if they're really heroes or not. Let's be real. Uh, <laughs> but the people that we're rooting for. And let's see what they've done after they've survived in chapter 38. Emerin took the book to wherever it was she lived in Valaris, leaving the five of us to eat. While Rice told them of our visit to the summer court, I managed to scarf down breakfast before the exhaustion of staying up all night, unlocking those doors, and very nearly dying hit me. When I awoke, the house was empty, the afternoon sunlight warm and golden, and the day so unusually warm and lovely that I brought a book down to the small garden in the back. The sun eventually shifted, shading the garden to the point of frigidness again. Not quite willing to give up the sun yet, I trudged the three levels to the rooftop patio to watch it set. Of course, of course, Ryzen was already lounging in one of the white painted iron chairs, an arm slung over the back while his other hand idly gripped a glass of some sort of liquor, a crystal decanter full of it set on the table before him. His wings were draped behind him on the tile floor, and I wondered if he was also taking advantage of the unusually mild day to sun them as I cleared my throat. I know you're there, he said, without turning from the view of the Sidra and the red gold sea beyond. I scowled. You want to be alone. It can go. He jerked his chin toward the empty seat at the iron table. Not a glowing invitation, but I sat down. There was a wood box beside the decanter, and I might have thought it was something for whatever he was drinking, had I not noticed the dagger fashioned mother of pearl in the lid. Had I not sworn I could smell the sea and heat and soil that was Tarkin? What is that? Rise drained his glass held up a hand, the decanter floating to him on a phantom wind, and poured himself another knuckle's length before he spoke. I debated it for a good while, you know, he said, staring out at his city, whether I should just ask Tarkin for the book. But I thought that he might very well say no, then sell the information to the highest bidder. I thought he might say yes, and it'd still wind up with too many people knowing our plans, and the potential for that information to get out. And at the end of the day, I needed the why of our mission to remain secret for as long as possible. He drank again and dragged a hand through his blue-black hair. I didn't like stealing from him. I didn't like hurting his guards. I didn't like vanishing without a word, with ambition or no. He did truly want an alliance. Maybe even friendship. No other high lords have even bothered or dared. But I think Tarkin wanted to be my friend. I glanced between him and the box and repeated, What is that? Open it. I gingerly flipped back the lid. Inside, nestled on a bed of white velvet, three rubies glimmered, each the size of a chicken egg, each so pure and richly colored that they seemed crafted of. Blood rubies, he said. I pulled back the fingers that had been inching toward the stones. In the summer court, when a grave insult has been committed, they send a blood ruby to the offender, an official declaration that there is a price on their head, that they are now hunted and will soon be dead. The box arrived at the Court of Nightmares an hour ago. Mother above! I take it one of these has my name on it and yours and Amran's. The lid flipped shut on a dark wind. I made a mistake, he said. I opened my mouth, but he went on. I should have wiped the minds of the guards and let them continue on. Instead, I knocked them out. It's 
been a while since I had to do any sort of physical defending like that. And I was so focused on my Illyrian training that I forgot the other arsenal at my disposal. They probably awoke and went right to him. He would have noticed the book was missing soon enough. We could have denied that we stole it and chalked it up to coincidence. He, trained, he drained his glass. I made a mistake. It's not the end of the world if you do that every now and then. You've been told you are now public enemy number one of the summer court, and you're fine with it? No, but I don't blame you. He loosed a breath, staring out at his city as the warmth of the day succumbed to winter's bite once more. It didn't matter to him. Perhaps you could return the book once we've neutralized the cauldron. Apologize. Oh, that was Fyra's voice. And this is where I need to know the voices, y'all, beforehand. Rice snorted. No, Ermin will get that book for as long as she needs it. Then make it up to him in some way. Clearly you wanted to be his friend as much as he wanted to be yours. You wouldn't be so upset otherwise. I'm not upset. His star. Semantics. He gave me a half smile. Feuds like the one we just started can last centuries. Millennia. If that's the cost of stopping this war, helping Amran, I'll pay it. He'd pay with everything he had, I realized. Any hopes for himself, his own happiness. Do the others know about the blood rubies? Ezreal was the one who brought them to me. I'm debating how I'll tell Amran. Why? Darkness filled those remarkable eyes. Because her answer would be go to Adriata and wipe the city off the map. Shuddered. Exactly, he said. I stared out at Valaris with him listening to the sounds of the day wrapping up and the night unfolding. Adriata felt rudimentary by, by comparison. I understand, I said, rubbing some warmth into my now chilled hands. Why you did what you had to do in order to protect the city. Imagining the destruction that had been wrecked upon Adriata here in Valaris made my blood run cold. His eyes slid to me, wary and dull, swallowed. And I understand why you'll do anything to keep us safe during the times ahead. And your point is? A bad day. This was a bad day, I realized, for him. I didn't scowl at the bite in his words. Get through this war, Rysand, and then worry about Tarkin and the blood rubies. Nullify the cauldron, stop the king from shattering the wall and enslaving the human realm again, and then we'll figure the rest out after. You sound as if you plan to stay here a while. A bland, but edged question. I can find my own lodging if that's what you're referring to. Maybe I'll use that generous paycheck to get myself something lavish. Come on, wink at me, play with me. Just stop looking like that. He only said, spare your paycheck. Your name has already been added to the list of those approved to use my household credit. Buy whatever you wish. Buy yourself a whole damn house if you want. I ground my teeth and maybe it was panic or desperation, but I said sweetly, I saw a pretty shop across the Sidra the other day. Issel would look to be like lots of little lacy things. Am I allowed to buy that on your credit too? Or does that come out of my personal funds? Those violet eyes again drifted to me. I'm not in the mood. There was no humor, no mischief. I could go warm myself by a fire inside, but he had stayed and fought for me. Week after week, he had fought for me, even when I had no reaction, even when I had barely been able to speak or bring myself to care if I lived or died or ate or starved. I couldn't leave him to his own dark thoughts, his own guilt. He'd shouldered them alone long enough. So I held his gaze. I never knew Illyrians were such morose drunks. I am not drunk. I'm drinking, he said, his teeth flashing a bit. Again, semantics. I leaned back in my seat, wishing I'd brought my coat. Maybe you should have slept with Cressida after all, so you could both be sad and lonely together. So you're entitled to have as many bad days as you want, but I can't get a few hours? Oh, take however long you want to mope. 
I was going to invite you to come shopping with me for that said little lacy unmentionables, but sit up here forever if you have to. He didn't respond, and I went on. Maybe I'll send a few to Tarkin with an offer to wear them for him if he forgives us. Maybe he'll take those blood rubies back. His mouth barely, barely tugged at the corners. He'd see that as a taunt. I gave him a few smiles and he handed over a family heirloom. I bet he'd give me the keys to his territory if I showed up wearing those undergarments. Someone thinks mighty highly of herself. Why shouldn't I? You seem to not have difficulty staring at me day and night. There it was. Colonel of Truth. In a question. Am I supposed to deny? He drawled. But something sparked in those eyes. That I find you attractive? You've never said it. I've told you many times, and quite frequently, how attractive I find you. I shrugged, even as I thought of all those times when I dismissed them as teasing compliments, nothing more. Well, maybe you should do a better job of it. The gleam in his eyes turned into something predatory. A thrill went through me as he braced his powerful arms on the table and purred. Is that a challenge, Fyra? I held that predator's gaze, the gaze of the most powerful male in Prithian. Is it? His pupils flared. Gone was the quiet sadness, the isolated guilt, only that lethal focus on me, on my mouth, on the bob of my throat as I tried to keep my breathing even. He said, slow and soft, Why don't we go down to the store right now, Fyra, so you can try on those lacy little things, so I can help you pick which one to send to Tarkin. My toes curled inside my fleece-lined slippers. Such a dangerous line we walked together. The ice kissed night when rustled our hair. Verizon's gaze cut skyward, and a heartbeat later, Azrael shot from the clouds like a spear of darkness. I wasn't sure whether I should be relieved or not, but I left before Azrael could land, giving the High Lord and his spymaster some privacy. As soon as I entered the dimness of the stairwell, the heat rushed from me, leaving a sick, cold feeling in my stomach. There was flirting, and then there was this. I had loved Tamlin, loved him so much I had not minded destroying myself for it, for him. And then everything had happened, and now I was here, and, and I might as very well have gone to that pretty shop with Rysand. I could almost see what would have happened. The shop ladies would have been polite, a bit nervous, and given us privacy as Rise sat on the settee, settee in the back of the shop, while I went behind the curtained off chamber to try on the red lace set I'd eyed thrice now. And when I had emerged, mustering up more bravado than I felt, Rise would have looked me up and down, twice. And he would have kept staring at me as he informed the shop ladies that the store was closed, they should all come back tomorrow and we'd leave the tab on the counter. I would have stood there, naked, save for scraps of red lace, while we listened to the quick, discreet sounds of them closing up and leaving. And he would have looked at me the entire time, at my breasts, visible through the lace, at the plane of my stomach, now finally looking less starved and taut, at the sweep of my hips and thighs between them, then he would have met my gaze again, crook the finger with a single murmured, Amir. And I would have walked to him, aware of every step, as I at last stopped in front of where he sat, between his legs. His hands would have slid to my waist, the calluses scraping my skin. Then he'd have tugged me a bit closer before leaning in to brush a kiss to my navel. His tongue... I swore as I slammed into the post of the stairwell landing, and I blinked, blinked as the world returned and I realized. I glared at the eye tattooed on my hand and hissed both with my tongue and that silent voice within the bond itself, prick. In the back of my mind, a ma sensual male voice chuckled with midnight laughter. My face burning, cursing him for the vision he'd slipped past my mental shields. 
I, re I reinforced them as I entered my room and took a very, very cold bath. I ate with more that night beside the crackling fire in the townhouse dining room. Ryza and the others off somewhere, and when she finally asked why I kept scowling at to every time Ryzen's name was mentioned, I told her about the vision he had sent into my mind. She'd laughed until wine came out of her nose, and when I scowled at her, she told me I should be proud. When Ryza was prepared to brood, it took nothing short of a miracle to get him out of it. I tried to ignore the slight sense of triumph, even as I climbed into bed. I was just starting to drift off. Well past two in the morning, thanks to chatting with Morm on the couch, in the living room for hours and hours, about all the great and terrible places she'd seen, when the house let out a groan. Like the wood itself was being warped, the house began to moan and shudder, the colored glass lights in my room tinkling. I jolted upright, twisting to the open window. Their skies. Nothing. Nothing but darkness, leaking into my room from the hall door. I knew that darkness. A kernel of it lived in me. It rushed in from the cracks of the door like a flood. The house shuddered again. I vaulted from bed, yanked the door open, and darkness swept past me on a phantom wind, full of stars and flapping wings and pain. So much pain, despair, and guilt. Fear. I hurtled into the hall, utterly blind in the impenetrable dark, but there was a thread between us, and I followed it to where I knew his room was, fumbled for a handle, then. More night, stars, and wind poured out, my hair whipping around me as I lifted my arm to shield my face, and I edged into the room. Ryzen. No response, but I could feel him there, feel that lifeline between us. I followed it until my shins banged into what had to be his bed. Ryzen. I said over the wind and dark. The house shook, the floorboards clattering under my feet. I patted the bed, feeling sheets and blankets and down. Then, then a hard, taut male body. The bed was enormous, and I couldn't get a grip on him. Ryzen. Around and around the darkness swirled, the beginning and end of the world. I scrambled onto the bed, lunging for him, feeling what was his arm, then his stomach, then his shoulders. His skin was freezing as I gripped his shoulders and shouted his name. No response, and I slid a hand up his neck to his mouth to make sure he was still breathing. That this wasn't his power floating away from him. Icy breath hit my palm. Embracing myself, I rose up on my knees, aiming blindly, and I slapped him. My palm stung, but he didn't move. I hit him again, pulling on that bond between us, shouting his name down it like it was a tunnel, banging on that wall of ebony adamant within his mind, roaring at it. A crack in the dark. And then his hands were on me, flipping me, pinning me with expert skill to the mattress, and taloned his hand to my throat. And still, Ryzen, I breathed, Rise, said through the bond, putting a hand against that inner shield. The dark shuddered, threw my own power out, black to black, soothing his darkness to rough edges, willing it to calm, to soften. My darkness sang his own lullaby, Swing, a song my wet nurse had hummed when my mother had shoved me into her arms to go back to attending parties. It was a dream, I said. His hands were so cold. It was a dream. Again, the dark paused. I sent my own veils of night brushing up against it, running star-flecked hands down it. And for a heartbeat, the inky blackness cleared enough that I saw his face above me, drawn, lips pale, violet eyes wide, scanning. Fyra! I said, I'm Fyra. His breath breathing was jagged, uneven. I gripped the wrist that held my throat. Held, but didn't hurt. We're dreaming. I willed that darkness inside myself to echo it, to sing those raging fears to sleep, to brush up against the ebony wall within his mind. 
gentle, soft. Then, like snow shaken from a tree, his darkness fell away, taking mine with it. Moonlight poured in, and the sounds of the city. His room was similar to mine. The bed, so big it must have been built to accommodate wings, but all tastefully, comfortably appointed. And he was naked above me. Utterly naked. I didn't dare look lower than the tattooed panes of his chest. Myra, he said, his voice hoarse, as if he'd been screaming. Yes, I said. He studied my face, the taloned hand at my throat, and he released me immediately. I lay there, staring up at where he now knelt on the bed, rubbing his hands over his face. My traitorous eyes indeed dared to look lower than his chest. But my attention snagged on the twin tattoos of each of his knees, a towering mountain crowned by three stars. Beautiful. Brutal, somehow. You were having a nightmare, I said, easing into a sitting position. Like some dam had been cracked open inside me, I glanced at my hand and willed it to vanish into shadow. It did. Half a thought scattered the darkness again. His hands, however, still ended in long, black talons, and his feet, they ended in claws, too. The wings were out, slumped down behind him, and I wondered how close he'd been to fully shifting into that beast he had told me he hated. He lowered his hands, talons fading into fingers. I'm... I'm sorry. That's why you're staying here, not at the house. You don't want others seeing this. I normally keep it contained to my room. I'm sorry it woke you. I fisted my hands in my lap to keep from touching him. How often does it happen? Rise of the violet eyes met mine, and I knew the answer before he said, As often as you. I swallowed hide, hard. <laughs> what did you dream of tonight? He shook his head, looking toward the window. Where snow had dusted the nearby rooftops. There are memories from under the mountain fire that are best left unshared. Even, even with you. He'd shared enough horrific things with me that they had to be yawn nightmares then. But I put a hand on his elbow, naked body and all. When you want to talk, let me know. I won't tell the others. I made to sliver off the bed, but he grabbed my hand, keeping it against his arm. Thank, thank you. I studied the hand, the ravaged face. Such pain lingered there and exhaustion. The face he'd never let anyone see. I pushed up onto my knees and kissed his cheek. His skin warm and soft beneath my mouth. It was over before it started. But how many nights had I wanted someone to do the same for me? His eyes were a bit wide as I pulled away, and he didn't stop me as I eased off the bed. I was almost out the door when I turned back to him. Rice still knelt, wings drooping across the white sheets, head bowed, his shark tattoo or his tattoos stark against his golden skin, a dark, fallen prince. The painting flashed into my mind, flashed, it stayed there, glimmering before it faded. But it remained shining faintly in that hole in my chest, the hole that was slowly starting to heal over. And that was the end of chapter 38, my friends. Dang, I thought we were going to get to some banging. I know, I know Lady Wada knows there's always one cure for my sadness. <laughs> and it is exactly what Fyro was trying to do. There could, I, I could be having the worst day ever, but there's nothing like someone you deeply care about just just tease you like that. And, it, you know, that helps me, helps, always helps me feel better. I hope y'all, um, e even if you have someone like that or you don't have someone like that, that you ha find your own way to be able to get out of a rut of unhappiness like that or morose kind of feeling. And if, uh, hey, if it's this book, you know, holla at that, you know. <laughs> holla at your boy if it helps that out but hopefully hopefully there's better ways because if if you're relying on free old free water here you know you know well, I'll, I'll take it i'll take it you know what 
I can't I can't hate too much. <laughs> We're gonna get into some feisty stuff soon though. It is it is happening. We're talking about red lacy, some pre tees. Also to have a whole like the one the one thing I'll say though, to have a whole pre tease of like exactly what's gonna happen. Um in any real scenario, that is gonna lead you on the path of regret later on because you're gonna be like, oh, I actually can't do that. We can't do that, or you can't do that. One or one of the three, or a combination of all three above. <laughs> and we'll we'll find out how Sarah plays along with that later. So y'all stay stay beautiful, stay hydrated, and we'll see ya in the next chapter.